everyone. I am Sophie Valex. I am a doctorate researcher at the Institute of Development Studies. Welcome to the lecture on social science perspectives on animal disease surveillance. In the previous lecture, we have seen how social dimensions are critical to understand health and development. Let us now look at a particular activity which is key for public health and development, which is animal disease surveillance. Disease surveillance or epidemiological surveillance applies to humans, animals and plants, all living beings. It involves continuous recordings to monitor the health of given populations and its associated risk factors. When talking about animal population, we can think of pets, livestock and wildlife. They can all be monitored. Surveillance basically consists of collecting information, data, that can be used by decision makers to orient and design disease prevention programs and control measures. Monitoring animal diseases serves two main goals. The first is to protect economic interests and livelihoods. Animal health is important for several aspects of human life and livelihood. Domestic animals provide transportation, drought power, fuel and clothing, as well as proteins that we can find in the meat, eggs and milk. In developing regions where agriculture represents a major part of the economy, livestock diseases constitute a significant impediment to production. Wild animals also provide a range of services to humans, including bushmeat, hides, tourist attractions, game trophies, ritual uses, and also offer significant potential to spread diseases and, in so doing, undermine human health and livelihoods. The second objective of monitoring animal diseases is to protect public health. Animal disease surveillance is an important component of veterinary public health. Veterinary public health was defined by the World Health Organization as the sum of all contributions to the physical, mental and social well-being of humans through an understanding and application of veterinary science. Monitoring the circulation of infectious agents between animals and humans, so zoonotic agents, represents the first objective of veterinary public health. It contributes to the physical well-being. And there is a special attention given to emerging zoonoses, which are zoonotic diseases new to a territory or with a changing epidemiology. If we consider the aspects of mental and social well-being, economic losses due to diseases spread from livestock or wild animals, as we mentioned earlier, also constitute an aspect of veterinary public health. Surveillance data can be used to generate basic knowledge on diseases, animal species, or ecological processes. But surveillance generally serves to substantiate the rationale for public health and sanitary measures. Surveillance data can aim at demonstrating the absence of disease, in such a case, a country can then be given a disease-free status. Or, to the contrary, surveillance can determine the presence of a disease and its geographical distribution. Both have important consequences for animal or meat trade and public health. Disease surveillance has increased considerably in the last decades, in parallel to the failure of disease eradication plans and the fact that a large pool of infectious diseases mainly zoonotic diseases, have been emerging in the last four decades. Zoonotic diseases' emergence will be developed later in the course. Surveillance may be based on many different data sources and can take multiple forms. The first way of differentiating types of surveillance is the means by which data are collected. We talk about active versus passive surveillance. In the case of active surveillance, professional teams plan to go out and research the presence of infections and pathogens in given animal populations. Whereas in passive surveillance, cases are notified without particular incentives. The typical case is the suspicious death of an animal. It can be reported by 
let's say naturalists, hikers or hunters, or local veterinarians, for instance. Passive surveillance generally relies on less resources than active surveillance. We can also use the disease focus to differentiate different types of surveillance. Surveillance can target a specific pathogen or be general. In that case, the laboratory analysis do not focus on a single agent. Finally, we can use the way in which units of observation are selected to make the difference. In some cases, we use structured surveys, for example, systematic sampling at slaughter, surveys for infections in clinically normal animals, etc. But we can also use non-random data sources. In that case, the sampling is not randomly done. We think of disease reporting or notification, any control programs or health schemes, targeted testing or screening, anti-mortem and post-mortem inspections, laboratory investigation records, biological specimen banks, sentinel units, etc. The type of surveillance applied depends on the outputs needed to support decision-making. Putting in place a surveillance program is a political choice and is subject to social norms and values. Social scientists explore surveillance systems through studying the actors involved. The people designing surveillance program as well as the people implementing them. Social science research look at both the political and socio-economic focus and the different understanding that these actors have of surveillance. If discourses like One Health, for instance, now claim for collaboration and synergy between these actors at all levels, from the local to the global, we need to examine the social and political economic dynamics at play in surveillance systems. Therefore, social science and development approaches to understanding surveillance are indispensable. In most countries, the veterinary services are part of the Ministry of Agriculture. Surveillance systems are formally organized around veterinary offices, but a variety of factors are generally involved. Even though it differ from one country to another, this diagram that I designed during my work on avian influenza in Thailand gives an idea of the involvement of several types of actors, from farmers reporting a disease to district veterinarians, lab technicians, etc. As expected, the surveillance data is gathered and analyzed at the central level of the veterinary services, often located in the capital city, and reports are sent back to local communities. However, the degree to which this feedback is done and the communication maintained can remain very limited, especially in contexts where veterinary services lack resources. The World Organization for Animal Health is also called OIE for Office International des Episodes. It kept the French historical acronym. The OIE is the intergovernmental organization responsible for improving animal health worldwide. The first mission of the OIE is to ensure the transparency of global animal disease situation, that is to say, diffusing disease information given by reporting countries to others. Anyone can receive by email weekly notification reports from the OIE or access the World Animal Health Information System, WAHIS. It's the OIE web interface database. WAHIS contains information about past and current notifiable disease events, now including wildlife diseases that are reported in the territory of the 180 OIE country members. This data focuses on positive identification of disease. The organization also provides support, like scientific guidelines and policy recommendations, to low- and middle-income countries to develop their capacities of their veterinary services and surveillance system so that major outbreaks are avoided or controlled as quickly as possible. My last slide is about challenges and opportunities for surveillance in a developing setting. The international community sometimes provides proofs distant from local realities, which makes compliance with international standards a challenge. 
Given that there is little communication and feedback at the local level, and that people do not always seek diagnosis when their animals are sick or die, and given that the surveillance system is based on positive identification, there are often cases which go unreported or undiagnosed. This gives rise to considerable uncertainty, both in terms of what is not being monitored and also in terms of when the next outbreak will be. Policymakers demand surveillance data to help them identify potential risks and to claim the use of evidence-based policymaking, but uncertainty is often ignored in this approach. Because of this, new techniques for animal disease monitoring are being explored. These include looking at how to undertake surveillance through drawing on local people's knowledge and through participatory research. For instance, participatory epidemiology is increasingly used as a method for surveillance to improve animal disease management by involving the animal-owning community in defining the problems, making decisions, and developing solutions. Participatory epidemiology is, for example, useful for detecting informal pathways of disease reporting and bottom-up approaches anchored in local cultures. We also assist to the increasing use of new digital technologies such as infrared thermography to monitor fever in wildlife or mobile phone-based notification as a surveillance which allows early detection of epidemics. So all these opportunities arise from what Ian Schoons called a rethinking of surveillance, with going from outbreak-focused surveillance to a more holistic and inclusive surveillance. It is also called systemic surveillance. In this last slide, I put up some references you can use for further reading related to this lecture. Thank you.